Well, I'm excited to get to share the word with you today. This is the last in the series that we've been doing on You Can Be an Original. And I don't know about you, but I have really enjoyed this series because I want to be an original. Originals are worth so much more than imitations. Can I get an amen? Originals, people want an original. They're willing to pay for an original. And, you know, especially a signed original. And I don't know about you, but I know that the Bible says that I'm signed, I'm sealed until the day of his coming. In other words, he's wrote on me that I belong to him. And if you're born again and Jesus lives on the inside of you, guess what? You're a signed original. It says you are sealed unto the day of redemption. That means not only are you a signed original, but you know how they seal an envelope and they put wax on it and they seal it down? He says he seals you. I mean, like, we're pretty important stuff, y'all. Elbow your neighbor and say, you're pretty important stuff. All right? And so this one is How to Be an Original Witness. That's the title of our sermon, How to Be Original Witness. And I was thinking about that, and if someone stopped you on a street and told you that they were a Steeler fan, especially here in Morgantown, and they urged you to become one too, wouldn't that kind of strike you as a little bit odd? And then if they had the Steeler jersey on right in the middle of the football field and they were screaming and shouting, you need to be a Steeler fan. Steeler fans are where it's at. Steeler fans is the team that you've got to root for. You'd think that was really, really strange, wouldn't you? Michaela's saying, I don't think that's strange at all. But you know what? Most of us would quickly become annoyed by that behavior. So how are we supposed to witness for Christ going forth with this unbridled exuberance and telling everyone inside about the Lord. Are we to use billboards? Are we to use our clothing? Because a lot of us have t-shirts, I love Jesus, you know. I mean, I wear t-shirts that say things. Our cars are covered with cutesy signs and, you know, bizarre sayings, like get right or get left behind. That's kind of scary, you know, when you're behind somebody and you don't know Jesus. Scare tactics aren't really what's supposed to work. Pictures and slogans advertising his worth, jewelry. And nowadays, even churches compete with each other to see who has the most clever sign out front. I mean, I go by them and I look at them and I go, that's really good. We should have that sign, you know? (laughs) All right? Please excuse me for being blunt, but this kind of witnessing often does more harm than good. Advertising techniques that pander to human nature produce results, but so does yelling fire in the middle of a movie theater. Amen? Amen? Promoting people to herd together has been reduced to a science, and ministries are taking full advantage of it. But based upon a half century of observation, it's becoming increasingly obvious to me that the herds contain far more goats than sheep. Satan's plan to sow tares among the wheat is working really well. Please note the Lord's word in Acts 1, verse 8. And it says, ye shall be witness unto me. Now, this is a statement of certainty in no way dependent upon man's devices. The Holy Spirit literally resides within every genuine child of Christ, and he is the witness of Jesus Christ, and we are Jesus' vehicle. He says, you shall be a witness unto me. He doesn't say, it sure be nice if you all be witnesses. He doesn't say, you know, some of you might, if you get filled with the Holy Ghost, be a witness, and some of you might not. He said, you shall. Now, when he says you shall, you shall. Amen? And if you're sitting there thinking, well, I'm not, we're going to find out today how you shall be. Amen? See, the reason why believers are exhorted to be filled with the Holy Ghost, and you don't have to turn there, but if you're taking notes, Ephesians 5, 18, it says, because when a life is full of the Spirit and controlled by Him, it's empty of self and exhibits supernatural power. Now let me explain something to you. If this was full of brown water, all I would have to do is turn on the faucet and fill this with clean water, and eventually if this was under the spout where clean water is coming out, that dirty water would be out in no time. Now if I didn't turn that spout off, which God never turns His power off, this glass would start boiling over. If it boiled over, you know what? If it was just going the whole time, and I wish I could do this, the whole time I'm preaching, pretty soon there'd be water on the floor and it'd be creeping up your ankles. And if we stayed here long enough, 
and this walls could seal it, we'd be in over our heads. Can I get an amen? I guarantee you, if that kind of experience happened in this church, I would not have to worry about who I was going to be here next Sunday. Because all of you would be here next Sunday, especially if that was a supernatural spout. Right? I mean, if you didn't see the source, but it was filling up. All right? You all would be out of here in no time, and you would have had a personal experience with the glory of God. When you have a personal experience with the glory of God, whether it's good, bad, or ugly, you're going to tell somebody about it. When you have a personal experience with something, come on, I know you all, you go to like the fine restaurants and you have a personal experience with that piece of cheesecake, everybody knows on Facebook, you had a personal experience with that cheesecake. When you have a personal experience and it is bubbling up on the inside of you and it's so good you want to tell somebody, everybody knows about it and that restaurant becomes very popular. Can I get an amen? Well, let me tell you something. The banqueting table of the Lord is just like that. And if you're not bubbling up on the inside of it, you just don't know about that yet. So I'm here to tell you, instead of Facebook, you're going to hear it from me first, that Jesus Christ is pouring out, amen? And he's pouring into people, and people are getting filled, and when people get filled, what's in comes out, amen? Hallelujah. So let's look at uh, Acts chapter 4, verse 13, because this power that I'm talking about is the word dunamis in Greek. And it's interesting, if you never studied the Bible, that the Bible was written in Greek, then it was translated into Hebrew, and then finally lots of other languages. But originally, it was Greek. And so if you really understand what the Bible's saying, you need to read it in Greek. Well, we can't do that. So we have preachers and teachers and people that can study and then show us what the words mean. So the word uh, filled with and have power with is the word dunamis, and it's the English word we get dynamite. Now, if I put off a stick of dynamite in here, it'd change us all. Can I get an amen? But see, that's what the power of God's supposed to do. It's supposed to change us all. Amen? Just like dynamite would change anything. Even if no words are spoken, each and every day, individuals would be attracted or repelled by the power of God. Now, here's a great example. Apostle will go into a restaurant you know he's filled with the power of God. And all of a sudden, the waiters or waitresses will start manifesting. They don't like him. They don't know why they don't like him. They just don't like him. Everybody else at our table who are heathens, they love him, but they don't like him. You know why? They see that power. They see something about him that's different. And if you don't like it, you'll be repelled from it. If you like it, you'll be drawn to it. Amen? So in Acts verse, or chapter 4, verse 13, and I'm in the King James Version, it says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Let me tell you something. If you hang out with Jesus, people are going to start taking notice of you. Because number one, you're going to get better looking. Number two, you're going to age a whole lot better. Why? Because it's the life of God. It's the Zoe life of God. And when it's on the inside of you, what's on the inside shows. If you eat too many uh, hot dogs and hamburgers, it shows on the outside, right? Well, it's the same way with supernatural food. You start eating supernatural food, and people know that you're eating something they don't know about. But most of the time, they're going to want to hear about it, all right? Witnessing for Jesus Christ involves 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365, 366 in leap year, days of obedience to him. It's not defined by filling your pocket with gospel tracts or carrying a big um, Bible uh, or pestering people. High-pressured sales techniques produce results, but seldom truly satisfying customers. My husband learned that when he sold cars. Sold cars. You can sell somebody a car today, and you can work real hard at selling them the car. But you know what? If you sell them a car and they don't buy the car, you're going to have to sell it to them tomorrow and the next day and the next day because they're going to keep coming in. There's just something about that car they don't like. They just wish they didn't buy it, and they're really wanting to unwind that deal. Can I get an amen? All right. So um, because of those who succumb to pressure usually have a nagging sense that they've been conned by a salesman. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to con anybody into believing in Jesus Christ. Amen? Numbers of people uh, continuing to be converted by the application of this psychological pressure uh, via confrontational evangelism do turn out some genuine Christians, but far more are just a Christian for a short time, and then they spiral down, and we wonder what happened to them. To catch a fish, 
without resorting to a net requires the right bait. Bass are highly unlikely to bite a hook baited with a dough ball. While red horse suckers will not intentionally bite an artificial lure designed for bass. And this analogy applies where believers are concerned. We're supposed to live in such a manner as to be good fish bait. To the degree we yield ourselves and our lives to the Holy Spirit is the degree to which he exerts his supernatural influence through us. To witness for Jesus Christ involves talking to others about him, but being very careful not to put the horse in front of the cart. Because telling fish about fish bait is absurd. Because they must see it or they'll never eat it. See, I can tell you about Jesus all the time. But unless you see Jesus in me and I make you hungry for what you see in me, you'll never decide to take the bait and live for him. And that's why Jesus says, I will make you fishers of men. Nobody else can make you fishers of men. Your parents can't preach enough gospel in your house to make you a witness, to make you a fishers of men. Husbands, nag your wife all you want. Nag your wife till Jesus comes home. She is not going to be a witness until she has a personal encounter with Jesus. And the bait he uses on her is bait that maybe he only uses on her. Mothers and fathers, you're wanting your children to come to Jesus Christ? You can put all the Bibles in the living room. You can play Christian music. You can take them to Christian movies. We took our kids to so many Christian movies, we scared the hell out of them. <laughs> Seriously, back when we were raising kids, Left Behind was in, and my kids thought for sure, every time they couldn't find me in the house, <laughs> they thought for sure the rapture happened. Still to this day, sometimes they call me and go, there's just not been anybody on the highways. Mom, just wanted to know if you were all right. It's not the right way. Amen? Glory. To witness for Jesus involves letting them see the bait and letting them want the bait. Letting them bite the bait. And guess what? We get so impatient. They bite the bait and we're like, ah! and we get it and it's like the bait is gone and they're gone. Right? I've been hanging out on the, on the pier long enough to know, you know what those real smart fishermen do? They just let them eat it. They just let them swim. They just let them wear themselves out in the world of water. And you know what? They just keep being really patient with them. Really patient. Sometimes, you know, they bring them in, and you know what? It's just been nibbled on. You know what they do? They put another big piece on there, and they just throw it out. We need to relax and realize we're not the ones in charge. We are simply the vehicle Jesus and the Holy Spirit and God Almighty uses to fish. Amen? And that's why we got to hang out with him because he says he's going to make us fishers of men. Now, I don't know about you, but he's been doing it a long time. He is probably like the captain fisherman. You know what I'm talking about. And if you've ever hung out on a pier long enough, you know some of those guys, they have all the tools. I mean, they know like, they, they, they take that fish out and they go, oh, I'm going to have to throw it back. They measure it out. They, they have everything in their little boxes to do everything. And guess what? God has it all in his word. But until we read his word, we're not going to know what's in that tackle box. Amen? So, Matthew 5, 16, let's look at that for a minute. It says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your moral excellence, I'm reading from King James Version, and your praiseworthy noble good deeds, and recognize and honor and praise and glorify your Father who's in heaven. You know what? When you just let Jesus shine through you, this is what happens. Men and women of God, your children, people on the job place, people at school, they see you, and guess what they think? Whew, God sure looks good. They think, wow, I wish I could have a life like that. Wow, I wish my finances were like that. Oh, I wish I had a marriage like that. Mm, wish my kids obeyed like that. Wish my kids were doing good in school like that. How's that happen? Is that an accident? No, that's not an accident. Let me tell you something. That takes a lot of obedience. And maybe not just in your generation. Maybe you're the first generation. Maybe it'll take to the second or the third or the fourth or the fifth or the sixth or the seventh generation to actually see the fruit. 
And you know what? I'm meeting people every day who are five, six, seven, eighth generation kids, and they are phenomenal. Their kids are phenomenal. They can play several instruments. They, they, instruments. they can sing. They can preach. They can uh, make things with their hands. They can sell houses. They can flip houses. They can do all those things. Why? Because the blessing of God is for a thousand generations. The curse is only for four or five generations. If you're still experiencing the curse of four or five generations, I got good news for you. The blessings far outweigh the curse, and you could turn it around in a day. Amen? Your lives can start changing today. Right now, right here, before you ever get out of here, the blessings of God can start coming on you. Amen? Hallelujah. So John 6, verse 44, it says, No one, I love this, is able to come to me unless the Father who sent me attracts them and draws them and gives him the desire to come to me, and then I'll raise him up from the dead at that last day. Let me shake this bush again. No one, everybody shout, no one one. is able to come to me. Leave that up, please. Unless the Father who sent me attracts them. In other words, it's the Father who sent me. It's Jesus on the inside of me. It's that dunamis power. It's that dynamite on the inside of me that draws people to him. It has nothing whatsoever to do with how good I am. Because, see, the more I love him, the more I want to hang out with him, the more I hang out with him and the more I love him. I'm like a teenager. Let me tell you about God. Right? Because he doesn't let me tell you about Johnny. Oh my gosh, he sits beside me in history class. He's even in my math class. He rides my bus. He plays basketball. Oh my gosh, I'm so in love. And all they do is talk about Johnny. How many of you parents have had a daughter that fell in love? Right? My little girl was Matt, 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 Matt. Let me tell you about Matt. I spelled his name M-A-T and she goes, Mom, his name is M-A-T-T. Don't ever spell his name like that again. He's not a doormat you can walk on. I mean, she just like went living on me. You know, I was just learning about this house spell Matt, you know. If you love somebody, you talk about them. If you love somebody, you want to hang out with them. If you love somebody, guess what? You usually become so intimate with them that you reproduce. You become so intimate with them that you reproduce something that looks just like them. And if you and him get together and you and him look like him, you're going to have little kids that look just like him too. Right? That's the way God made it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So good fish bait appeals to fish at a fundamental level. They do not have to be taught how to recognize it or urged to partake of it because it meets a basic need. They have a hunger for the bait. And deprived men have a similar need. There's a vacuum in their heart. And where the knowledge of God once existed, there's an itch they can't scratch. There's a hunger they can't satisfy on their own. And when God cast a yielded believer in front of them, they always react to the bait. Yielded believer. See, lots of people believe. Even Satan believes, but he's not a yielded believer. Yielded believers are the best bait in the world. Because when you're a yielded believer and God uses you for bait, you'll yield yourself to take on whatever form you need to be able to be salt or light or living water to the person he puts you in front of. You'll give them money you thought you'd never give. God will make you generous. You'll take them home and feed them and you thought you'd never have those kind of people in your house. My kids used to... I used to drive them crazy. It'd be really late at night, and you'd hear. And I'd walk downstairs, and there'd be a lady there, and she was an alcoholic. Many of you know her. You remember her from our other facility. She's gone on to be with the Lord. She was an addict, and she was an alcoholic. And I would just take Jody or Michelle out of their room, put them in the room together, and I'd put this particular lady in the room. And to this day, both my kids would do anything for anybody. Both of them work in social work positions. One of them has adopted two children that were not her own. The other one probably had 800 kids in her life that she goes to court with and does things with. Why? Because they'll do what you do, not what you tell them to do. And they may think you're crazy that you bring a a, a drunk addict into your house and put them in a room and shut the door and just let them sleep it off and let them have a safe place. 
But you know what? They know where to come. Amen? But unlike fish, humans can see the hook. And the majority will back away because they don't want to be caught. They think they're not clean enough. They think they're not good enough. They think if they get caught, they're going to have to give up what they're doing. They think if they get caught, they're not going to have any fun anymore. They think if they get caught, life's going to be boring. Do I have any fish in here that were scared of the bait? I was scared of the hook. I was so afraid I was going to have to be doing what I'm doing right now. <laughs> and I love what I'm doing. I do it all day long. It's the joy of my life. But see, I didn't know what I didn't know. So the hook scared me. As a consequence, only a relative few will overcome their built-in aversion to God and be drawn by the Holy Spirit to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Let's look at Matthew 7, 14. And here's the scripture that you use to base that on. It says, but the gate is narrow. In other words, it's contracted by pressure. See, when something's narrow, it means there's a constriction pushing it smaller. The world is pushing it smaller. The, the, the uh, selfishness is pushing it smaller. The need for materialism is pushing it smaller. The I want, what about me? What about how I feel? What about what I think is pushing it smaller? It says, the gate is narrow and the way is straightened and compressed that leads to the, a way to life. And few, few there are that find it. I mean, I feel like I just need to start clapping right now that you guys have found it. Amen? Then referring back to our analogy of the Mountaineer fan, what would you think of him or her if you observed them rooting for another team? What would you think of them if, they, if all of a sudden uh, they would have, um, you know, a different jersey pulled over their other jersey? And you could see the blue and you could see the, the black and, and uh, you know, uh, gold of the Steeler shirt underneath. You could see the Mountaineer one on top, and then you could see a Red Sox shirt on top. And now all of a sudden, they're, they're, they're talking to you about the World Series and the Red Sox. And, let's put it worse, and they're in the middle of New York City. All right? What would you think about that? But see, that claiming to be a fan of one team while actually being loyal to another is two-faced and frowned upon by most of us. People should show their true colors so that we all know where they stand. And the principle definitely applies here of our testimony of Jesus Christ. Very few things in the world will upset people as quickly and to a greater degree than seeing someone act in a manner, in a manner contrary to what they said they believed. See, and only God knows how many people have been and continue to be repelled by the hypocrisy of professed believers, especially if those who are so careful to carry around their flashing neon Jesus sign. All right? Advertising their loyalty to Christ and then fail to be consistent with their profession, under the best of circumstances, Christian living under the microscope of public scrutiny will occasionally fail to live up to the high standards that you and I all put them under. Because we still struggle as human beings. Can I get an amen? And for that reason, we must strenuously avoid the temptation to call attention to ourselves by blowing our own horn. How many of you have said, I'll never do that? and ended up doing it. Because as soon as you say it, the devil's going to come and say, oh, really? Many of you know me really, really well. And you know, my husband and I have been married, you know, 40 years. And when we were married seven, I wanted a divorce. Me. The child that grew up in a divorced family who said, the one thing I will never do is if I ever get married, I will never divorce because I have seen what it has done to me. And I still bear the ramifications of that divorce. And I hate divorce. I know why God hates divorce. You can't take a, a piece of wood and another piece of wood and put them together with glue, especially super glue, because God says the two shall become one, and then separate the wood without having pieces of this wood and pieces of this wood uh, coming apart with the other person. And now you add children into that, and you have a very splintered society. But yet at seven years, I was on my way to divorce court. I didn't care what I said before. You know why? That generational curse of divorce was so strong in my family from generation to generation to generation to generation. Like a snowball, it was picking up weight and power and speed at every hour and every day and every year towards my generation. And when it hit my house, 
my door just opened wide open. And I didn't know what hit me because I didn't know anything about that. I was just a little Methodist girl, minding my own business, married to a Catholic boy, minding his own business. And guess what? You think that we're supposed to be witnesses and fishers of men? The devil sits on the banks of life and he throws out lures that your granddaddy bid on, that your grandmother bid on, that everybody in your generation and your family lineage has bid on. And guess what? You'll bite hook, line, and sinker because so did they. But God. God changes everything. That was a good place to clap. <laughs> Let's look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 1 through 5. In Matthew chapter 6, 1 through 5, it says, Take care not to do your good deeds publicly or before men in order to be seen by them. Otherwise, you will have no reward reserved for you or waiting for you with and from your Father who's in heaven. Thus, whenever you give to the poor, do not blow a trumpet before you as the hypocrites in the synagogues and in the streets uh, likely do, that they may be recognized in honor and praised by men. Truly, now, if you're not here on Wednesday nights, I just taught you how to read, study, and understand the Bible. When you see the word truly, it, it means like, there's no, make no mistake about this, listen very carefully, this is exactly what's going to happen. And if you see truly, truly, you better really pay attention, all right? So it says, truly, I tell you, they have their reward already. But when you give to charity, do it with your left hand and not let it know what your right hand is doing so that your deeds of charity may be seen in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Also, when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets that they may be seen by the people. Here he goes again, truly. I tell you, now when he says truly, that means you can't get out of this. He's not gonna change his mind. Black is black and white is white, and he's not going to negotiate with us on this. Truly, I tell you, they have their reward, and look what it says, in full already. Now, you, you say, well, I'm a Christian, but you know what? If you're doing it for all the wrong reasons, then people know you're doing it for the wrong reasons, and now you're not getting blessed. And the Bible says he rejoices in the prosperity of his saints. You know why he rejoices in the prosperity of his saints? Because you all make him look so good when you prosper. And he wants you to prosper.